So I just wanted to do a message, something that's you know just been on my heart, and I just wanted to share it with you tonight. And you know, we usually take up prayer requests and we take testimonies, and we'll probably get to do that in a minute. But I just wanted to share a message with you, and I hope I hope that you enjoy the message and get something out of it. It's a message called the sin of one. You know, the sin of one. I just want everyone here to know that there's absolutely no sin in your life. Absolutely none. Even in secret, you know. Even if nobody else in the world knows about it, other than yourself, that doesn't in some way impact other people that are close to you. And there's an example... There's some numerous examples in Scripture, but there's one that really touched my heart that I wanted to share with you tonight. It really makes you think. And that comes from Joshua 7, if you've read Joshua 7. Now, if you remember it, in Genesis, Moses is leading the people out of Egypt, and they walked around that desert, circling that desert for 40 years. And Moses has died, and Joshua has become the new leader of the Israelite nation. And he's just about ready to step into the promised land that, you know, that God had promised them. 40 years, just about ready to step into the promised land. But he's got this fortress in his way called Jericho. Mm -hmm. Now Jericho is just a massive fortress with thick walls and you know, it's like 18 feet high. It's just impregnable. He just could not get by it. He's got one of the most fiercest armies in Canaan at the time. No one could get into Canaan without first coming by Jericho. And no one had ever been able to do so. So here they've got this fortress facing them before they can even step foot into the promised land. But God says, hey, don't worry, I've got this. I've got this, don't worry about it. God says, you know, I'm here with you. Not only am I with you out in the wilderness, and not only am I here with you over here, but I'm here with you right now as you're facing, as you're looking at this massive obstacle that's separating you like a boundary, a stronghold preventing you from getting to this promised land. So they just march around the city for seven days doing exactly what God instructed them to do and on that seventh day they stop and they shout and they just scream hallelujah and blow all their trumpets and all their horns and those walls just came tumbling down. And then Joshua had a word for, I mean, God had a word for Joshua. God told Joshua, he says, this is the first city. So I want the fruits of this city to come to me, to my people, to my temple. The first fruits belong to me. So he instructs Joshua, he's going to send all of his people into Jericho now that it's all destroyed. You got to remember, they didn't have to do anything. They just walked right in, and they're going to pick up the spoils. He says, I want you to bring all the spoils out, and you're going to give them to my priest, because giving them to my priest is giving it to God. So that's what they did. So you got to remember, at this time, they were facing one of the most ferocious armies in the world at Jericho. The Israelites were not an army. They were just a bunch of nomads walking around in the desert for 40 years. They haven't been in any battles. They don't have a whole lot of armor. They're just a nation of people trying to get from point A to point B. And it's taken them 40 years. They did not have GPS back then. But God did it all for them. He just says, go in and collect the spoils and just bring it to my people. So all the people, they grab these little you know, sacks and they go into Jericho and they fill all the sacks up and they're bringing it out to give it to the priest. Bringing it out to give to the priest. Everybody except for one 
guy. Everyone did what God told them to do, but one guy. So he's in there, he's got his little sack, and he's looking around, he says, hey, nobody's looking at me, and there's something over there I really like. Yeah, I really would like to have that. Nobody's looking. Nobody's going to miss it. They're going to get everything else out here. So he pockets these couple of items. Nobody's going to know about it, right? It's my secret. So after Jericho, the Israelites faced their second city on their march to the Promised Land. And it's a tiny little city. It's not even a city. It's a village. It's called Ai. It's really difficult to spell. It's A-I. It's called Ai. Tiny little village. They don't even have a, an army. They just got farmers and everything. So Ai sends out what few men they have to face the approaching Israelite nation. I mean, they've got a million and so people coming to this tiny little village. And the Israelites are saying, hey, this is going to be a piece of cake. You know, look what happened back at Jericho. We didn't even have to lift our thumb. We didn't have to do anything. We just marched right in there and picked up the spoils. Well, guess what happened? These tiny little group of farmers destroyed the Israel advancement even to the point of killing 36 of their people, 36 of their men. So they were defeated by this tiny little village. Now you've got 36 families and you've got wives who don't have a husband now and you've got children that don't have a father. And Joshua's going, what happened? What happened? So he gets all the people together. And he's trying to find out what happened. And he goes to the priest and he's asking the priest, what happened? Will you please talk to God for me and find out what happened? So the priest come back to Joshua and he says, there's sin in the camp. What do you mean there's sin in the camp? Well, somebody took something that belongs to me. Somebody took something that belongs to my temple. So they search the camp, and they find that Achan had been unfaithful. It was he that had stolen these few items. So they take and gather Achan, and they grab his daughters and his sons, and they gather up all of his livestock and his oxen and, and sheep, and they bring them all out, and then they stone them to death. And then after they stoned them, they burned everything. Now people today, you know, when they read this story and other stories like it in the Old Testament, you know, they ask, why would 36 people have to die just because of something that this one person did? Why did they have to suffer because of this one guy? Why? Why does God do that? That's not fair. That's just not fair. But what people don't realize today is that whatever you do, you know, whatever the one does, it affects the whole village. Mm -hmm. It affects the whole church. It affects the whole nation. So we've got to be careful about what we do. You know, there's no secret sins, nothing that doesn't affect others in our lives when we are sinful like that. And when God says, you sin, God is speaking in the plural. He's saying, you all sin. Not just you, you sin. Yes, it was just one God, just one guy. But God says, when you sin, everyone is going to pay. 
Now in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul writes to a church in Corinth. And in this church, a situation of sexual immorality is going on. And many people in the church know about it, but they're not doing anything about it. They're just allowing it to go on. And Paul is telling them, he says, don't you realize that a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump? You know, just like a rotten apple in a barrel is going to ruin that entire barrel. It's not an isolated situation. It's not just one person. It's not just one couple or one family. It affects everybody. Because we're a body. We're the body of Christ. So if you were to go to the doctor, say you were to go to the doctor this week, and the doctor is going to tell you, Ray, you've got cancer in your pancreas. Now I break those words, but... The doctor says, Ray, you've got pain, uh, cancer in your pancreas. I'm not going to go, woo-hoo, I've only got cancer in my pancreas. No, because if you've got cancer in your pancreas, you've got cancer all throughout your body. You know, what, go, what happens here is hurting over here. It's going to affect over here. It's going to affect over there. If you've got cancer in one place, you've got cancer everywhere. So if I'm sinning, or my cancer or my sin is affecting the entire body of Christ. And I just want to conclude by saying that we're in, our, in the final <laughs> days. These are the end of times that we're in. God's going to be coming again soon. And not only is he coming soon, but he's going to be passing judgment. And if you've got any secret sins, this is the time to ask for forgiveness and to repent and turn away from those wicked ways. Amen. 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 Well, well, that was heavy. But that was something that the Lord has just been putting on my heart all week long. I just had to share it. And maybe I'll be doing some every, every week or so again. Because it felt good to do another mini message. Amen. <laughs>